Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. I hope you're enjoying the day so far. My name is Lindsay Brown from the Beyond Clean team, and I'd like to thank you for joining us in the fifth of an 11 part collaborative webinar series between Beyond Clean and Census Technologies. The Census team embraces the team experience, and they do so by understanding that providing for the sterile processing community happens through nurturing the individuals like yourselves. This is exactly why they've launched the Census Continuing Education Series, True Grit, True You. If you haven't joined us for a Beyond Clean virtual event, I'd like to call your attention to a couple of features. Your screen is very interactive and very customizable. So everything that you see on there can be moved around, can be resized. You'll see on the top right corner, a list of resources that the speaker for today's webinar has compiled for you. These resources will allow you to take your self-reflection uh, a bit further after this presentation. Um, there's a question and answer tool on the left-hand side of your screen down toward the bottom. You can submit any questions that you have for the speaker throughout the presentation. And those questions will be addressed at the end during the live question and answer portion of the presentation. Um, high level disinfection has many required steps and documenting these steps is an important and safe part of reprocessing. If you're not using proper documentation, how do you know that these steps were completed? Well, Kelly Swales, your presenter for today, will use the next hour to explore ways in which this can be done in your department. So without further, without further ado, I am excited to turn it over to your presenter, who happens to actually be just down the road from me here in Minnesota, Kelly Swales. <laughs> Kelly, take it away. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. So as Lindsay said, I'm Kelly Swales. And I work um, currently as a clinical analyst for Census Technologies. I'll give you a little bit about my background. Um, in my role at Census, I visit about 50 hospitals a year where I go in and do a um, Census Tract utilization assessment to see how you're using our product. And then from there, based on findings, um, we schedule you for training. And so with that, um, I also do what we call um, Census Tract Essentials for Managers training as well as classroom training, either in our main office in Nashville or at customer sites. So I began my healthcare career as a surge tech um, back when we were processing the majority of our own instruments. And so that's how I first learned stroke processing. From there, I became supervisor and manager of stroke processing. And then I've also worked as clinic and business analyst of Periop Services. So they tell customers, I think like I've, I think I've worn every hat um, in the, in the pre-op because I would you know, schedule surgeries, I'd work on billing, and um, so, you know, I always say to customers, I, I've been in your shoes and, um, and I know what it's like when something new comes along or there's a change. So at this time, I'd like to get going um, and present to you quality compliance for processing high-level disinfected items. Our objectives. So our objectives here are, you know, think of that IFU and, you know, that IFU, some call it the SOP, and that is on there, the first step in processing a scope is that bedside clean, free clean, point of use clean. Many different terms, but they're all the same thing. And so, you know, really key to know when that was done. And then along with that, let's evaluate the why. You know, why do we do what we do? Why is it important to know when that bedside clean was done? Why is it important to document everything with your scope processing? And then let's look at those documentation requirements and see how we can, you know, maybe be more efficient with them or else, you know, what are we supposed to be um, doing for our documentation? So as I mentioned that point of use pre-cleaning. And so think of the first step, that very first step, the point of use clean, the bedside clean, pre-clean, that is when it should occur right when that insertion tube is removed from the patient. And so when I go to hospitals, um, you know, and then just I've seen it different seminars and the such or webinars that I've attended, you know, you think about that, um, that, that pre-clean and if it's not done or in the event that it's um, not thoroughly done, the biofilm that can be created, um, the bio burden that's left behind, and then it can be very difficult to clean that scope. 
And many of our scopes are already difficult to begin with, so we don't want to make it any harder. And so it's always, you know, key to get that first um, that 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 first task done in creating um, in in cleaning that scope. So documenting the point of use pre-cleaning. So when you think about that pre-clean, I have seen where they write on the disposable scope container that, you know, the, the date and the time or who did it. And then along with that, I've seen it on a post-it note. I've seen it written on a patient sticker. And then that's how they know. So a few things with that. I've also seen that post-it notes laying in the hallway. So obviously when they were walking down the hall, it came off. But once you throw away that disposable scope container, you throw away that sticker, that post-it note, it's no longer documented. And what if it gets thrown away before you started the process? And then, you know, now you don't know, should I be doing delayed processing? Should I not? Um, you know, are there any issues with that? And so really like to see that that is documented and that it is documented somewhere where the person who's going to clean that scope can see that. Um, I've had, you know, people tell me, well, it's documented in the patient's chart. But think about when you're in the decontam room and you're processing a scope, no one's going to go into that patient, you know, into your electronic medical record, look at the patient's chart and see when that was done. So I like to see that we can make that easier for people, come up with that documentation, and then see that it's being done on a regular basis, and that it's done for all our scopes. So here I have a poll question. And this is, how does your scope processing area document scope pre-cleaning? So if you just click on the options that are there, I'll give you a few minutes to complete that. Alrighty, so it looks like we are done here. Let's give a minute for our results to populate. So, you know, looking here, I'm not really, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all to see that we don't document it. You know, I think that's a common occurrence, but that's when I ask, well then how do you know if you should be doing delayed processing or not? And then um, no one said that they document something that's disposed. I do see that they document on paper that is kept and stored. And then we document the electronic tracking system, awesome. And then unsure. So I, I expected to see a lot of variation and I'm not surprised to see that they don't document it. But think about, you know, that, that first step, if you don't document it, how do you know that it really happened? And so I like to see that it's done and then you know whether you need that delayed processing or if the scope hasn't been properly pre-cleaned, you know who needs some education. So cleaning steps. So think about your cleaning steps. There are IFUs out there, I've seen them, that are 180 pages. There's no way in the world that I don't think, you know, we can expect anyone to have that memorized. We can expect anyone to, you know, follow that step by step by step, everything down to a T. And so I do believe there are just some, some checklists and it's the key things that need to be done. So here's an example of what I use for cleaning steps um, for scopes. And I'd like to see that that bedside clean is in there. Next on there, I have that retrieve the AAR connector. This is one of my favorites. And think about, you know, I have seen, and, and I did this at my hospital, where if this scope has red, white, and blue instrument tape on it, I then use the connector that has red, white, and blue instrument tape. It's a nice, simple, easy way to match up um, what goes with what. However, at the same time, many facilities are trying to get away from instrument tape. So then your options are a chart on the wall or to have a three ring binder and then put, you know, laminated sheets in there. So I've kind of seen a variation of it all. But how nice to have this right in your cleaning steps. So that when I get the scope and I look at it and I see that the uh, bedside clean was done at this certain time, and then right there in those cleaning steps, it tells me what connector to get. So before I've you know touched a dirty scope or I've, I've done a whole lot, I can grab that connector and then I can start my process. That visual inspection, um, perform the leak test. If you have a flush brush and suction for two minutes, anything that is required, 
you can put there in your in your cleaning steps and yet leave it very brief but yet what is required and then one thing i do like is that you know i performed all cleaning processing steps in accordance to the ifu for this specific scope and so the nice thing with that then is that you know staff are saying yes i have done everything so think of it as you know assembling a container and still processing you're checking off and you're you know that everything's in here and now you're done you fold up that count sheet and you're good to go and so kind of that same thing this is kind of like your last check mark for cleaning is saying that i have done everything so when you think of these checklists you know think it's much like a pilot so of course in my line of work i travel a lot so i feel like i can you know speak about pilots and flying because I know that when I fly, I know they have that checklist and I know that my life is in their hands. We'll think about it in processing the scope. That patient's life is in your hands. And so every time you process the scope, you know, you could be determining whether or not a patient has some negative outcomes or they have some successful outcomes. So we always want to make sure that we're doing everything as we should and then follow those proper cleaning steps. So next on here is the why. So I'm a big believer in why. You know, even raising my children, if there's, you know, if we have to do something, I always explain the why. Because I'm not out just to make your life miserable. And, you know, if you know the reason, then I feel you get better reception, better feedback, and better compliance. So it's pretty obvious we clean the scope for the next patient so it's safe to use. But if you really think about, you know, what's behind that why, and it's the purpose of cleaning and high-level disinfecting is to remove microorganisms, bio-burden, thereby preventing cross-contamination, which can lead to illness, infection, and even death. So you think about what we are removing, you know, we're getting rid of those bacteria, we're getting rid of that viruses, the parasites. Um, we're helping to prevent healthcare-associated infections. And it's all about patient safety and best practice. And so anything that we can do it's, you know, it just makes that much better. But at the same time, there's so much expected of us that we have to figure out a way to do this so that it is um, done in an efficient manner and then it is done um, as it should be and what is required. So think about the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's what we're doing. We are preventing, you know, the what, the what could have been. So on to disinfecting. So with disinfecting, there are many methods of disinfecting the scope. You've got Cytex soap bins, you've got Metivators and OERs and um, GUS systems and TE probes. So there's many different ways to high level disinfect something. And the thing is that they all have in common though, is they all require documenting the process and the results. And according to Amy guidelines, it should include the staff name, the date, and the time. Now, very seldom do I ever see with, um, you know, manual documentation when you're writing, very seldom do I see the time. And that is an ST91 where you are supposed to put down the specific time. So there you think, all right, you know, we need to go back and change some of our documentation um, because whether, no matter what it is, if it's a manual, if it's mechanical, there's no deviating from that process. And then all that documentation needs to be completed. And even think of your, um, like a Cytex soap bin. You know, we were at 12 minutes, and so then we documented the start and the end time, and then made sure that it was 12 minutes. So there's a lot that needs to be um, documented, a lot that is required of us. And there again, just anything we can do to make it easier and more efficient so that we can all be successful. So drying. So when you think about how fast bacteria can multiply, it's kind of scary. And you think of, you know, now we're dealing with a virus, you know, how fast can viruses um, multiply? And I think pretty fast considering that we're in a pandemic right now. But when it comes to scopes and you think of drying that inner lumen, you dry those channels, so for years I've heard, oh, you know, the, the machine dries the scopes, so we don't have to. And you're correct, it does dry it. But if it thoroughly dried it, then why do you grab a lint three cloth and dry your scope as it comes out of that machine? So 
if you read the IFU, you will read in there where it does say that you should be drawing in it with forced air for a certain amount of time and a certain PSI. I always make sure you follow those PSI um, instructions because you don't want to damage your scope. If you, the air is too forceful, you can um, end up with um, unintended consequences that you don't want. And so if that water that is in that lumen, if it doesn't get dried, think about water can harbor bacteria, fungi, viruses, et cetera. And so we need to get all that water out so that there is no moisture in there and that it is safe then to go hang um, or lay in a scope cabinet. And there is, so one exception to this, there is one exception to not having to dry that scope. And that is, you know, and this is in many of the IFUs, can't say that they're in all because I don't run all of them. But if you take that scope out of the machine and you bring it right to a patient room where, you know, the patient's in there or the patient's on the way and it gets used. So if it's going to be used within a matter of minutes, then yes, then you can go ahead and skip that drying process. But I really and highly encourage everyone to read that IFU, look at what's required of drawing that scope, and then work with your facilities department um, with leadership so that way you can get the correct air that is required, and then you can get the correct gauges. So you can you know watch that PSI. Think of it, you know, you don't want to be like you're blowing or, you know, putting air in your um, tire because that is going to blow a scope. It's got to be a soft, uh, like 5 or 10 PSI um, to uh, keep your scope safe and not damage it. So we have another poll question here. How does your facility document manually drawing a scope with forced air after the AER or AER process? So I'll give you a few minutes here to complete that. All right, so it looks like our questions are in here. Our answers, I should say. So about 11% are saying we don't dry the scope after the AER or OER. 55% um, say we dry the scope but don't document the drying process. So there, that's, you know, that's great, you're drying it, but I really would encourage you to document that it's been dried. And then we also have, we dry the scope and document an electronic tracking system and then unsure. So I'm very happy to see that, you know, that that number of scopes that are being dried is 55%. And then there again, um, you know, let's, let's work on that 11%. Let's get everyone, um, you know, drying that scope afterwards and then we'll have uh, better patient outcomes. So next on here is documenting. So document, document, document. Um, when I am providing training, you'll hear me say many times, document, document, document. You know the old saying, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. And so with the scope processing, to ensure that everything has been completed, to ensure that, you know, that scope is safe to use, I highly recommend documenting everything that is a key step in that process. And so, you know, you, you you document the pre-clean, you document the leak test, the cleaning, uh, that residue check, and then down to the disinfecting, the chemical test strip, and then drying, and then you also have your expiration date. So nowadays everyone has that scope hang time policy. And then from there, um, some document that patient information. Sometimes that patient information is just documented in the patient's um, EMR, and so maybe you don't have to worry about that in um, scope processing, but just wanna make sure that that, that is being done and then along with that is, you know, that, that's a lot of paper, a um, lot of writing, especially since you have to put your full name, date, and time. And so along with that, then all those papers, it's a lot of documents to store. And so have you ever really thought about what's on those papers that you're storing? Um, I think back of, you know, the end of every month or the first of the month, I should say, I would find the stack of all the papers from the endo um, room on my table in my office. And it was, I was like, ooh, gross. And I would just open the box, throw them in, and then I'd wipe down the table. And now I think back and it's like, you know, what was I thinking? You know, we should have put them in a big peel pack pouch, we should have put them in a Ziploc, something. 
And then along with that, how do I know that my cable is the only place they put them? How do I know that someone else didn't, they didn't put them someplace else and somebody moved them? And so just kind of think of um, how gross the things um, that are on those papers. And then along with those papers, I was thinking, you know, I just dreaded ever having to go dig through those papers and find something. And I used to joke and say, oh, you know, if I ever have to, I think I'll put on a hazmat suit. Um, you know, put on, I'd be in scrubs, I'd put on a bunny suit, ortho hood, anything I could to protect myself. But in reality, that's, that's probably true. I mean, I, I would have, because if you think back to that previous slide about how fast bacteria can multiply, well, what happens when that's been sitting there for months or years? And so that's where, you know, really, I, I, I really like the electronic tracking systems uh, because then you don't have all that gross paper. So next, as we talk about electronic, you think about you've got electronic and you've got paper. And, you know, I, I see combination of both um, throughout my, my career in healthcare. Um, you know, when I started out, yes, we were doing paper. And then um, think about kind of the benefits, the pros and the cons of both of them. Um, one thing that I like really a lot with the electronic is that you print out a label you can customize that label, um, you know, no matter what tra your tracking system you have, but then that label can tell you when it was processed, you know, and um, so then, you know, when it was processed and when it expires. And so then you're not trying to read somebody's handwriting and, you know, or someone didn't count right or count wrong on their dates. And so then you're able to then, um, you know, just have that nice print and then along with that, you have your competency verifications. Um, you can link that competency to specific scopes or HLD items. And so then that way you know you're always 100% compliant. And then reports. So um, one thing that I liked with uh, when I had you know, the electronic tracking system is being able to look at the um, inventory throughput. So I was able to see how often were our scopes used, how often, you know, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, are we turning over all these scopes? And then with that, use that information to show that we need some more scopes. So when capital comes around, I can request and say, you know, and I did, you know, request and say that we need some more scopes. And um, that way my staff won't be so stressed out with trying to hurry up and turn all these over. So another poll question here when processing HLD items, is your documentation, and if you can select from there, um, what type of documentation you have? here to load. Oops. Let's see here. I have a little technical difficulty. There we go. Now we got our results. So as I expected, kind of a nice variety there, you know? So we have um, electronic, we have paper, we have electronic and paper, and then none that are unsure. So that's great. And, um, you know, I when I see electronic and paper, I think when I went to electronic, I, I still did paper for a while. That was kind of my security blanket. Change can be hard sometimes. Sometimes you have to get past that learning curve and then you're okay. Um, but the nice thing is, you know, if you're doing electronic, I highly encourage you to always be, um, you know, reviewing that, making sure that everything is complete and everything is as it should be. Which then leads me to my next slide here. So compliance checks and quality audits. So whether you're doing paper, you're doing electronic, you want to make sure that somebody is checking those um, records, those documents on a regular basis. 
And so, and, and if you're not doing it, then how do you know that that scope is safe to use? How do you know that everything um, is as it should be? So what is your policy at your hospital? If there's missing information, um, you know, I, I remember uh, one facility I worked at, if you're missing information, then it just became a, you know, oh, hey, you forgot to document the leak test. Oh yeah, I did it. All right, can you just write it in? Well, should we really be doing that? You know, ethically, should we be doing that? And so we really want to look and um, do those compliance checks, those quality audits, because you can also identify trends and then see maybe some education needs to be done. So if Sally is continually forgetting to document that leak test, then maybe Sally needs some um, education, some kind of helpful hints, reminders to document that leak test. Along with that, maybe Bob, every time he does that residue testing, or not every time, but maybe it's more common than you think it should happen or, or than you like. So if he's doing residue testing and it's failing, and now he has to um, you know, re-clean the scope, then maybe someone needs to work with Bob. I did have a gentleman who, the greatest, sweetest man in the world, um, loved to work in decontam, but he needed cataract surgery and he needed glasses. And so, you know, me as a, his leader was like, you know, how can I work with you? How can I help you? And, you know, yes, he took the time off, he got the surgery, he got the glasses, and then things were beautiful again. And so it's, you know, maybe that's what the case with Bob. Maybe he just needs some new glasses so he can see that he's, you know, not quite getting everything clean. Or maybe he didn't know that this lever moves. Um, or if you move it lever this way or that way, it's easier to clean. And so I was, you know, looking for that, um, looking for those trends, and then looking where you can do some um, education. And then along with that is that scope hang time policy. So if a scope is expired or going to expire, you know, um, does your facility, do you have to walk around and look at all the tags? And um, so, you know, do you feel at all the tags? There's a positive. I like to find the positive in everything. So the positive to that is you will get your steps in, especially if you're a large facility, but think of the time. So the time that can be wasted, the time that it takes to walk around and look at all the tags. You know, if you're going to the ED and ENT and anesthesia and speech and, um, you know, cardiology. So if you have a look at all those tags, that can take up quite a bit of time. Whereas with an electronic tracking system, you can then identify, hey, th these are the scopes that are expiring today or tomorrow's Friday. So Friday, I want to see what's going to expire over the weekend. If you don't staff on the weekends, maybe on Fridays, I go pull anything that's going to expire on the weekend and process those. I was at a facility and they did um, color code. So they would know, you know, green expires on Tuesday and blue expires on Wednesday. And that's a great system too, but you still have to walk around. And so think of all the time that um, you're walking around and how that could better be spent um, in the department doing things. So when it comes to scope processing, the goal is protecting our patients. And so when protecting our patients, think about it, it's that document, it's that compliance checks, and it's the reports. So document, document, document. You wanna make sure you're performing those compliance checks, quality audits, to make sure everything is perfect. Yes, I use the word perfect. Um, you know, many people say there's no such thing as perfect, but I do feel when processing a scope, there is and there should be um, the word perfect because it should be perfect. Um, you know, I know if I'm having a scope done on me or, you know, scope procedure, I wanna know that that processing was perfect. And I wanna know that I'm safe and I wanna know that our patients are safe. So in closing, just a reminder, you know, a lot is required and expected of the amazing people that process HLD items or scopes. You know, we used to just be scopes, but now we have to expand that to HLD because there's probes and there's all different kinds of things that are being processed. But think of the, you know, so it's amazing people that are processing those and with all the complexities that are required of everyone, that's why you guys are awesome. That's what makes you th these amazing people. And so you're keeping patients safe. And most of those patients you may never meet. You may never know who they are. But those patients, they're someone's child, someone's parent, spouse, sibling, neighbor, best friend. You know, maybe you don't realize that the person standing in line in front of you at the grocery store had a scope procedure last week. You process that scope.
and he's healthy and he's here today in the grocery store because of you properly processing that scope. So I wanna thank you for participating in today's um, educational event. For more education and CE opportunities, I invite you to download the True Grit app. So you see the little picture here. If you go to your app store on your phone, whether Android or Apple or whatever else is out there, and you just type in True Grit, you will see that. And if you download it, it is, it's um, a social media site, but it is geared towards sterile processing, scope processing, and just the, the, the department and OR relations. And so it, it's great. You can ask questions. Um, there's people giving answers. And, you know, and it, and it can be a question of how do you do this? But, like, there was a question on there that said, does anybody like working in Deacon Town? And I replied, yes. You know, back in the day, I used to love working in Deacon Town because as a manager, if I went on the floor and worked in assembly, I would get pulled. You know, people would be, you know, in interrupting me, stopping the department. But if I went to Deacon Town, everybody left me alone. So I could really knock out all those trays and get them through and get them done. And so just, you know, I encourage you along with that, the month of September, um, Census is offering a um, contest. So whoever has the most posts, um, the most interaction, you know, like one prize is a $100 ISHM um, gift card. And so there's um, lots of fun things going on. But of course, if you download that app to find that, and then tomorrow at 11.30 a.m., um, Derek Murray, one of my wonderful coworkers, he will be doing a live mini talk on leadership. And if you missed Derek's um, presentation that he previously had, I highly encourage you to you know, look at that. You can find that on that True Grit app and then watch that. Um, Derek is amazing. My, I watched his um, webinar when he, when he did it and my daughter was home. And so she came in my office and she's like, what are you doing? Who is that talking? And I told her, and she's like, he's like wonderful. I want to be his friend. And I'm like, oh, you would love Derek. Um, and I keep forgetting to tell Derek. I, I need to send him a text and tell him that. So unfortunately, he lives in St. Louis. I'm in Minnesota. Otherwise, yes, I would be hanging out with him. So thank you, everyone. Um, stay safe out there in this crazy world. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our question and answer session. All right, Kelly, thank you so much for that great presentation and sharing that important information. Uh, as we prepare for the question and answer session, I do want to encourage everyone, and I know some of you have already done so, uh, type in your question for Kelly about the uh, content that she presented in the question and answer engagement tool on the lower left-hand side of your screen. Um, I also want to call your attention to two things. There are icons along the bottom of your screen, a pink one, is a call to action button where you can actually register for the next census webinar coming up at the end of September on the 24th. And then also there's a CE icon in the bottom right hand corner along your icon list. And clicking on that, you will have access to the CE survey and certificate. You will also receive an email an hour after this presentation with a link to that survey where you can also download your CE certificate directly from there. With that, I want to get to some of these great questions that have come through. All right, so Kelly, the first question for you is what electronic systems are available for tracking and documentation? So, you know, I know that there's um, a couple different ones out there. I'm only familiar with two. Um, it's because I've, I've used those two. And so that is um, Census. We have, as part of Census Track, we have Scope Track. That's you know what I highly recommend because I'm more familiar with it, and then I know that Metavators has one also. Um, with with our scope track, I can tell you, you know, you can document everything that is required, and then um, you can run wonderful, beautiful reports. Um, and yeah, it's very helpful. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and we do have a couple of SenseTrack specific questions that I'm going to send your way. Um, the first of which is, is there a way to program into SenseTrack to alert when a scope expires so that we don't have to walk around? Yes, so you have, you have a few options. Um, what we have um, in our SenseTrack program is you can have a priority list. So anytime you click on that scope processing module, you can have a priority list there and it will show, you set that, you know, so like in my demo and what I recommend, 
um, when I'm with customers is setting it for four days. And the reason being is because on Friday, I want to see what's expiring today, there's day one, what's expiring Saturday and Sunday. And then I feel like we have a lot of Monday holidays, or maybe it just feels that way since it's at, at the end of summer, for Memorial Day and Labor Day. <laughs> um, and so then that way you're seeing, you know, those next four days. And so that's one option. The other option is by creating what um, a scope hang time, expiration report of kind of how, you know, whatever you want to name it. And you could have that report just saved. You can click on it every day and look at it. But the other feature, and this is what I love, is the fact that you can have that report emailed to whoever you want. So, you know, I always say have it emailed at three, four o'clock in the morning or something. That way someone can't sleep, they come into work early, they can see it. And so with that, um, you could have it sent to ENT. So ENT, you could send only their reports and their scopes. And then you same with the ED, anesthesia. So then that way, if they have to bring you their scopes, it's you know specific to theirs, and then they know to bring them to you. Or if you go around and collect them, then you can have that report sent to everyone that works in the um, scope processing area, and it just comes across in an email, and then they know right there which ones to go grab. All right, thank you for that. Do you have any example sheets for documentation from point of use bedside cleaning and manual cleaning that are in compliance with Joint Commission and CMS? Um, so I, I do. Um, I don't, I mean, not I can show here, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so yes, and if you, I mean, if you have that person's email address, I can always reach out to them. Wonderful, yes, they certainly do. All right, this next one, we are a small hospital. What should we use for ATP testing? So that would be up to you. You know, I know there, there's ATP testing, there's um, residue channel check testing. And so I guess it would be a matter of, you know, who are your preferred vendors? And then with that, um, reach out to your vendors and see what's in your budget, what is what you think is most user friendly, and then go from there. Okay, how do you electronically document the drying of a scope? Yep, so in SenseTrack, what I do is I create a location, and that location is your drying time. And, you know, if it's supposed to be 10 minutes, I put it as, you know, dry time of 10 minutes. So then after it comes out of that AER, you know, I wipe down the, the, the outside, I dry that manually, and then I hook that connector up to dry the inside of the scope, and I scan it to that, that's then going to show me that, for example, it went into um, drying at 12 o'clock. Well, then my next scan, if I go to put it in the scope cabinet, better not be before 1210. Because if it is, then that means I didn't dry it the full 10 minutes. So a nice way to see that, you know, real time and know that, you know, did that, was that dried for 10 minutes or five minutes, whatever is required. All right, very good. Are you going to add the drying to the SensaTrack template? So that can be added now because that could be added in as a processing step. And so after your, um, you know, you could put it as a processing step after disinfection, you could come back in and then you could document it there. Or like I said, you could scan it to that location and then it would be documented in that scope history. Okay, wonderful. We have scope track and our endo staff would never agree to documenting the bedside clean. How do you get them to do this? So think about when I was talking about the why. So, you know, stress to them the why. Um, you know, you don't want them to think that you're just creating busy work for them or unnecessary work for them. And I would start off by first showing them the IFU and how that is the first step. And then explain to them that delayed processing so if we don't know when a scope, when, you know, if we don't know when that bedside clean occurred, we, we should be um, you know, doing that uh, delayed processing. Explain how delayed processing can take up a whole workstation because you're having to soak a scope and how it takes a long time. That scope is now out of commission. And then along with that, you know, make, work with them. Say, you know, ask them, do they have a better option? Do they, do they have a better way of, um, of doing this? So get their, their feedback um, and then just work to get their buy-in. 
And then along with that, though, I really do believe that it comes down to leadership and holding people accountable. You know, I, I do hear all the time, oh, you know, they would never do that or, well, they're supposed to, but they don't. But there's always that accountability piece and, you know, holding people accountable for what they're supposed to do with their job because it is job performance and it is patient safety. Right. Our educator does our quality checks to make sure everything is complete. And if something is missing, she brings it to you, you write it in. Sometimes it's the next day or a few days later. Should we be doing this? So me personally, I'm going to tell you ethically, no. You know, when I was in grad school, we had the question, um, you're we supposed to write a quick, you know, paragraph page, whatever, on ethics. And I wrote one sentence. So, of course, our instructor said, you know, all right, Swales, get up here and tell us what you wrote because you were done in two seconds. And I said, it's doing what, doing what lets you sleep at night. And so if something's keeping you awake, you know it's not right. And then it's up to you to correct it. So think about if they are doing that, yes, you don't want to have missing documentation. You don't want to have missing documentation and run into those problems. But if you're falsifying doc documentation, there really is no difference. And so that's what I like about electronic tracking system because like in your processing steps and stuff, you know, you have to complete one before you go to the other. And so that's how you can then, you know, guarantee that everyone is checking out that they're doing these things. And if someone came to me and said, will you fill this in? I mean, if I, I mean, and I, I honestly would struggle because if I know that I did it and I know that I know without a doubt, you know, maybe I'd be more, willing to write it in. But if it was last week, you know, I can hardly remember what I had for breakfast. You think I'm going to remember, you know, what I did last week with the scope? No. So I would not be comfortable with that. And I would just, you know, see what's in your hospital policy and, um, and then go from there. Okay. This next question says, we are so busy and short staffed that we don't have time to document everything. Is documenting everything a requirement? So a few things. One, look at ST91 and you'll see all the things that are required. And um, if you haven't read through it, you're, you're probably gonna be shocked as to what is required. The main thing with that, along with that, I should say is that, you know, I see initials and the top of the page is, is has a date on it, you know, so that that's our date. And I see initials. Well, if Amy S1091 is saying it should be the staff person's name, the date, and the time, well, initials are not is not a name. And then I, you know, rarely ever do you see the time. And so think about what is required along with, you know, patient safety. And if your facility feels better taking it one step further, doing a little more, a little above and beyond, so that way you know your patients are safe and you know you can sleep at night, then I say you just have to do it, you know, do what needs to be done. And then if you're falling behind, then you can explain the why. So it's kind of back to that why again. Or if it's, you know, hey, I, I, I read an ST91, we're supposed to be doing all these things, but in order for us to do this, it's gonna take this amount of time. And then maybe it's, you know, how, how can we get this done? And maybe you prove your case that you need another FTE, you know, or a 0.5 FTE. Um, maybe you prove your case that you need a tracking system because you don't have to walk around for an hour every day looking at expired scopes. So there's, you know, a lot of different options. I'm, I get very creative with um, making my case. And so that's where I feel is, you know, people really, it's like, make your case, explain that why, um, you know, research, find evidence-based uh, practice, find some evidence-based results, and then you can show how, you know, it is so important that we do what we're supposed to do. Okay, this next question says, high-level disinfection seems like a process that can put people at risk. Why don't we sterilize scopes and stop the HLD process? <laughs> so, I have one of that myself. Um, you know, because, yes, you see what's in the papers, you see what's in the news, you hear of, you know, unfortunate 
events that have happened and you ask that, you know, why? And I mean, that would almost be a question for the scope manufacturer and the sterilizer manufacturers to say, you know, why don't you make a scope that can be sterilized? Um, why don't you make a sterilizer that can sterilize scopes? And, you know, it kind of comes down to there again, that evidence-based practice that shows that HLD processing is safe. Um, and so if it's done properly, and so even if you didn't clean a scope properly and you sterilized it, well, you're still sterilizing debris. You're still sterilizing bio burden. There's still biofilm. And so is that really any better? And so, you know, with that, it's, you know, I heard people say, I love to see someday, you know, all the spalding classifications will change and, you know, we'll be sterilizing scopes and who knows, you know, you think of where, where were we 30 years ago? So things are always changing and probably more to come on that. Um, but I don't have the exact answer as to the why, but I know it would be down to the scope manufacturer and the sterilizer manufacturer. Okay. This next question says, we don't staff our scope processing area on the weekends and the nurses process the scopes. Do you think this is safe? So, you know, I am a firm believer in use it or lose it. You know, um, if you're not doing something on a regular basis, are you going to be comfortable doing it? Especially if you're by yourself um, on a weekend or off shift. And so what I would say is, you know, look at your hospital policy. What does it state? Um, are competencies completed? And do they feel safe? You know, I would hope that you're in an environment where you don't feel comfortable doing something that you can speak up and you can say, you know, I'm on call this weekend and I haven't processed the scope in six months. I'm a little nervous. Is there anyone that could come in and help me if I have to process the scope? And then that way it's education and you can learn and have that refresher. Okay, this question goes back to the actual um, specifics of documentation. Someone told me that we're supposed to document the time along with the date and our signature. Is this true? Yes, so ST91, um, of course I don't know, right in there. Um, so if you, if you have an electronic version of um, ST9, Amy ST91, if you do control F when you're on the screen, that'll be your find, type in the word time and you know, just kind of click through, because you will see the word sometimes, it'll pull that up. But as you are going through and clicking that, clicking that, you're gonna start seeing how many times it says in there that that documentation should be the name, the date, and the time. Okay, uh, next question, uh, let's see. A tracking question, can you track peel pack items in Sensatrack? So it all depends, you know, if, um, and so that, that's not HLD, that's more soil processing. And so as far as um, tracking them to a patient, yes, I can know that this, you know, if I'm using case tracking, I can see that this pill pack was used on this patient. Um, as far as finding like a history that, you know, that instrument went through decontam, that instrument went through assembly, and that, um, not yet. So that's kind of a, there are certain ways you can, there are certain ways you can't. Okay, uh, this next question, this is the first time I'm hearing about drying a scope with forced air. Is this a new process? So um, I've been, I've seen it, you know, I've done it in my facilities. Um, boy, when I started almost 20 years ago as a scrub tech, we were drying scopes. So it's not new to where I have worked and if you look at the IFU, um, you know, you will see that it's in there for, like, I, I'm going to say majority because I've not read every IFU, um, but there is that, that dry, um, that dry time that is required. And, and if you think about it, 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 it makes sense. So knowing that water can harbor bacteria and viruses and, and other pathogens, you want to make sure that that water is not just sitting inside of a scope that is um, hung up for five days, seven days, 12 days, whatever your hang time policy is, because then that bacteria is just gonna multiply. Okay, this next question says, we high level disinfect things besides scopes. Should we be documenting the pre-clean for those items as well? 
So there again, look at that IFU. Um, you know, pretty sure that a TE probe um, or you know a, a, any kind of a probe, ultrasound probe, that those all mention you know cleaning right there at the point of use, and that those get cleaned right away. And it would be the same thing, whether it's a scope or a probe or any kind of a, uh, or anything else that you're putting through uh, high level disinfection, is looking to see you know what that IFU says. Okay. I've never seen or used an electronic tracking system in scope processing. Are a lot of hospitals using them? Yes. So if you recall back to our survey, you know, we had quite a few that were using electronic. And, um, you know, I feel that they're becoming more and more friendly, or back up, user friendly. Um, so a lot more user friendly. And, you know, I can speak for scope track for our system in that you know you have options. You can scan the scope, you can type in the serial number, so you don't always need to have a, a scanner. And then our latest feature is we have foot pedals. So as you know, if you're you know you're in scope processing and you're working and you're in water up your elbows, and um, you know you don't want to be reaching up maybe touching the computer screen. So we have amazing foot pedal that you can use, along with that an RFID um, wristband kind of looks similar to my watch. So to log in, you just kind of, you know, put your watch or your the band like a tap and go. You're logged in, and then it's just strictly using foot pedals if you want. And so then you don't have to worry about, um, you know, a keyboard getting wet or a mouse getting wet. Um, I know they have waterproof ones. but um, So there's different options. And, yeah, our latest with the foot pedal, it's like, oh, where was that back when I was processing scopes all the time? <laughs> That does sound pretty nice. <laughs> yeah. uh, the next question says, isn't an electronic tracking system expensive? Our hospital would never purchase that. So, you know, it's so sometimes it's hard to identify sometimes the return on investment when it comes to serial processing um, because we're preventing and we don't know what we're preventing. So in general, we're for everything that you do in serial processing, whether it's, you know, sterilization, health disinfection, Everything is prevention. And so really, if you look at what, what you're going to spend on that, there is a nice return on investment because, yes, you are preventing because you're documenting. You know, staff have to document that they did these certain things. Along with that is the time that you can save. So if I have to, you know, every time I do something, I write on a piece of paper, and I'm writing down my name, the date, look at the time, or, you know, writing that down, and I'm doing it for all these steps or I'm having to walk around and look at scopes every single day, or someone's going, someone has a gun, even if it's all the, own, all the individual departments, if they have to spend that time looking at all the scopes, all that time adds up. And if you look at the time that we spend um, doing all that, that can you know pay for a scope tracking system in no time. And I know like ours, you know, we can um, customize them. So yes, if you're a small endoscopy center, you know, you may have different needs in a, a large facility that processes 100 scopes a day. So, yes, I don't think they're that expensive um, because the benefits are so wonderful. Okay, wonderful. Uh, next question. Do you see a time when the industry will move to disposable scopes? So, you know, I, I, I do feel that that could happen someday. I know that there are some that are out there. However, it's the expense. So with the expense of that, um, who knows if it'll ever happen. And, you know, I even thought, well, maybe they make them um, where, you know, think of some of your equipment and store processing um, where you save your, your stapler and you, you, you save certain things because there's companies that will take them, they'll reprocess them, and then put them back into use. You know, whether it be something like that. Um, but, you know, I think there's too many mechanics in that scope. And because um, I even thought about, well, why not just have a, you know, a reusable head and then the insertion tube is what's disposable. Um, but think about if you ever looked at um, a scope on the inside, you can Google that. Um, there's a lot of um, a lot of things inside that scope. You know, it's not just a tube like your garden hose. So... Okay, next question. We are a small hospital with just one colonoscope and one gastroscope. 
The scopes are cleaned at the bedside, but there is no documentation, and there are only three RNs, and I clean all the scopes. Is there a reason for documentation if we have such a small team? So one thing with that is if you only have the one and you don't have a handful of, of staff, you know, when that scope is done, are you taking it right in and processing it? Or are you having to wait until, you know, someone else is done with their procedure and they're doing it? And so if you don't know that, or you don't know that every time you touch a scope, you know when that bedside clean was done or who did it, then I would say, yes, document it. Because what if that scope is dirty? What if that scope was not properly clean? And, you know, there's that education behind it. Maybe that someone needs that, that education. Okay, great. And then one more question that did come through. Do you know if there are any FDA approved scope drying cabinets available for purchase? That I don't know. You know, I would reach out to your reps um, and, you know, probably contact your, your scope rep, um, your AER or OER, um, you know, contact those reps and then see what's out there. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have ISHM this year, but that's always a good, fun, great way to see um, what's new, what's out there. And maybe we'll have it next year. And then you can go to that vendor fair and um, see what's new. All right, wonderful. And that is all of the questions that came through. Kelly, thank you so much. One additional question for you. What is the Minnesota State Fair food you're going to miss the most this year? Corn dogs. Corn dogs. Corn dogs. Yeah. And, that's, um, yeah. and that was a big debate question actually last night when I was with friends. It was, you know, what, what do you like better, bottle pup or corn dog? And it's corn dog. And <laughs> that, I mean, I go to State Fair and not anything other than corn dogs, and I'll eat a couple of them. So. Yeah. <laughs> and bonus points to any attendees who know the difference between a pronto pup and a corn dog. All yes. right. <laughs> um, thank you so much for providing this content today to the, all the attendees. Um, everyone, make sure you take advantage of the additional resources that are available on your screen. There's also a downloadable document that talks about the True Grit Influencer Program. So you can download that if you want to learn more information. Like Kelly says, if you haven't already downloaded the Census True Grit app, I certainly encourage you to do so. I have it. I think it's wonderful. I think it's a great resource uh, for the sterile processing community. Uh, so certainly do so. And just a reminder, in the month of September, Census will pick the top three True Grit influencers from the Census True Grit app to win various prizes. And these prizes are sweet. There's things like a $100 Isham store gift card and things like that. So um, certainly check out the app, uh, download it from your Google App Store or your Apple App Store. Uh, on behalf of Beyond Clean and in partnership with Census Technologies, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. And as always, we certainly encourage you uh, to keep fighting dirty. We'll see you again next time. Thank you.